Let's go ahead and prepare our hearts and pray. Father, we thank you for this moment now. As I transition into declaring what you have given me to decree, I pray, Father, that you would speak through my vocal cords and think through my mind and operate through my limbs, that your very power, your glory, your anointing, your wisdom, and your favor would flow through me in such a way that burdens would be removed, yokes would be destroyed, lives would be changed in Jesus' name. I declare that your word goes forth unhindered and unchecked by any satanic or demonic force is going to accomplish those things that are sent out to do, and it will prosper in every heart in which it is sown. I declare this by faith in Jesus' name, and all of us said amen, amen. and amen. Amen. Come on, give God some praise one more time. <clears throat> and so, let me just say this. Um, when I was at uh, Marlboro Heights Missionary Baptist Church, and Brother Poe right here was with me many, many years ago there, uh, I, when I served at Marlboro Heights Missionary Baptist Church, that's where I went to Bible college. And the guy that taught us Bible college, Dr. Charlie Dean Palmer, the late Dr. Palmer, had four doctorate degrees, had been in ministry for 60 years. And one of the things that Dr. Palmer taught me, he said, Brother Pena, when you're preaching, if the, if the minister of music is led by the Holy Spirit, you shouldn't have to tell the minister of music what to sing. If they're led by the Holy Ghost, then the song that's playing right before you come up is always going to prepare you for the word, right? And, and, and that's been my testimony. I've been preaching for 28 years, and it's like, man, it's just like that song just set me up. Well, this morning, we didn't have a song, but what we had was Milton. And because he's Dominican, and because he's from New York, no, and because he has the Holy Ghost, he set me up. He didn't even know he was setting me up. Milton up here a few minutes ago, Milton said, hey, as a man, it's hard. Say it's hard. That's what he said. He said, it's hard to be a man because you got to be a provider. You got to be a protector. You got to take care of your family. Say it's hard. That's what he said. That's what he said. But I'm going to tell you that it's easy. Say it's easy. It's easy when you embrace the grace of God. This is revelation that God has given me. What I teach, anybody that listens to me knows that I teach the grace life. Say the grace life. So the grace life, when you embrace the grace of God and now it's not you doing it, right? So you will work harder when you embrace the grace of God. I'm Dominican, so I know how to work. I've been working since I was paid job since I was 13. But, but, but when you embrace the grace of God, you work harder than you've ever worked in your life, but it's not you doing it. It's the Lord doing it through you. And so, so at that point, you will work harder, work longer, but your body doesn't break down. You will work harder, work longer, but you're not stressed out. You will work harder, work longer, but you'll sleep well at night and your sleep will be sweet. You know what I'm saying? And the Lord will multiply your hours of rest and people come up to you and say, how in the world can you do all the things that you do? And the answer is by the grace of God. Right. And so so it's all by the grace of God. So as a man, I want you to know that, yes, you are called to, to have all of these responsibilities, but you can do it by the grace of God. There are moments in your life where you have to rely on the grace of God, but if you just condition yourself to rely on the grace of God every day, and you go into every opportunity, every meeting, every opportunity, uh, every conversation, every activity, knowing that God is on me, in me, with me, and for me, then, then now it's not about me. It's all about him. Say amen to that. Amen. So, so that's what we want to do is embrace the grace of God. So my assignment this morning, and then I have something to preach tomorrow as well, but my assignment this morning for the men is to teach on this topic, the grace to lead. Say, I have the grace to lead. Say, I am a leader and I have the grace to do it. So, yes, it is true, Milton, that, that we do have this responsibility as a man to take care of our family. We do have this responsibility as a man to be a provider. We do have this responsibility as a man to be the pastor of our own homes, to be the spiritual leader. But when you embrace the grace of God to do it, you can do it and it's not effortless, but it can be sweatless. Say amen to that. Say this, say, I have sweatless victory. Oh, Brother Pena, Brother Pena, hold on. I thought the curse 
under the curse. When, 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 when God judged the serpent, the woman, and the man, wasn't part of the curse on the man to earn everything by the sweat of your brow? So, Brother Pena, aren't we supposed to sweat? Say, no, that's part of the curse. Jesus delivered us from the curse of the law. No. And so, so, no, no. Now I can actually have sweatless victory. I can experience victory because I'm not relying on my human power or ability or human strength. It is the grace of God. I don't take any pressure to perform. I'm not taking on the pressure to perform. It's actually not even about me. It's all about him. And so, so what re religion does is religious people. Anybody here was raised in a religious household? I know I was. Being religioso, you know what I'm saying? Like real religious, like 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 you know you gotta do this, like you know like you know I had to do this and had to do that. And religion puts the spotlight on man. Religion puts the emphasis on you, and it's all about you and what you have to do for God. But when you understand, the Bible says in John chapter one that the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth came through the Lord Jesus Christ, when you know that Jesus came to provide us a life of grace, and now I embrace the grace life, now it's not about, watch this, the spotlight is no longer on me. And what I do for God, the spotlight is on God and what he's already done for me. So now I get to believe and receive what God has already provided. Now I get to open up my heart to receive the, the eyes of our understanding. The Apostle Paul said, let me pray for the believers in Ephesus. This is my prayer. That the eyes of your understanding would be enlightened, flooded with light, so that you can know what God already gave you. So that you can know what is the hope of your calling and the exceeding great riches that we have in heavenly places, in Christ Jesus, towards us who believe. And so there are things that God has already stored up for you. There are things that God has already stored up for me. And by the grace of God, God reveals it to us. So when watch this. God, how many of you know that God made plans for you before the world began? Do you believe that, Elon? So God made plans for you before the world began. The problem is that when you're born, you're born ignorant of those plans. So God made the plans, but you don't know what they are. Then you get born again. And when you get born again, the Holy Spirit begins to reveal to you what was prepared for you, but concealed from you. And at that point, you have to make a decision because by that point, you already have plans. <laughs> so now it's like, uh oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so now God is showing me plans. Oh, man. But I already have plans. So now at that point, you have to make a decision. Will I be stubborn and keep doing my own thing? Or am I willing to give up? Watch this. For me to become the man that God called me to be, I have to be willing to give up the man that I became on my own. So I have to be willing to die to self. The secret to success in Christ Jesus is not more trying, it's more dying. So I must learn how to die in order to live. Say amen to that. All right, so 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10, very familiar scripture. The Apostle Paul says this. He's, he's, he's explaining this thing. That it's up there on the screen, but I'll, t I'll just tell you what it says. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15 and verse 10. What's your name, sir? Huh? Terry with a T. All right, Terry. So Terry, watch this. So the Apostle Paul is saying, "What? hey, Terry, guess what? I am who I am by the grace of God, right? And then he pauses there and he's like, okay, I am who I am by the grace of God. That sounds good. But then, but then, wait a minute. What if somebody says, well, if it's all grace, then that means I don't do anything? It's like, well, mm. so then he comes back and says, hey, Terry, let me explain. I worked harder than all the other apostles then he stops he's like man that don't sound right <laughs> that is not now because that sounds like it's me you know what i'm saying and it's not about me it's all about him so he goes well let me explain though terry i am who i am by the grace of god check it is true that i worked harder than everybody else check but then again it wasn't even me it was the grace of god through me so it wasn't even me so i can't take credit for it 
Because, oh, well, Brother Pino, you did it. You got up early in the morning. You do this. You do that. You, that was not God. That was you. Anything that I do, it was still the grace of God. So, so, so I have to acknowledge that I am who I am by the grace of God. So I'm going to talk about the grace to lead in three areas. As a man, and there's some young men here, and you're going to get there one day. But listen, watch this. There's three areas. I'm going to talk about you have the grace of God on your life to lead uh, in, in these areas, in faith, in family, and in finances. I'm going to talk about faith. I'm going to talk about family. I'm going to talk about finances. So as a man, Milton was talking about your responsibilities. Yes, the Bible is very clear that as a man, you're in a position of leadership. Say leadership. Let me read some scriptures for you so you get it. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 23. The Bible says, this is all New International Version. For the husband is the head of the wife. I know as men, people like to read that. I'm the head. Say, I'm the head. Yeah, you like to read that, right? So, I'm the head. The husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, which is the Savior. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 3, the Bible says, But what I want you to realize is that the head of every man is Christ, and the head of every woman is the man. But, but you see how that's written? The head of the man is who? Christ. Your wife will never have a problem following you if you're following Jesus. Your wife will never have a problem submitting to you if you're submitted to Jesus. The problem comes when you want her to submit to you and you ain't submitted to nobody. Your, watch this. Say this. Your authority comes from your submission. Your level of authority comes from your level of submission. This is not in my notes. I'm going to just slide this in for free. I'm not even going to charge for this point. And so, so uh, uh, the, the, when Jesus was having a conversation with the, with the Roman centurion, he says, hey, uh, the Roman centurion comes and says, hey, uh, yeah, my servant is at home. He's sick. Jesus said, all right, here we go. And here's another one. All right, fine. Where's your house? Let's go. I'll go heal him. And he said, no, no, sir, I don't need you to come. Jesus said, what? He said, no, I don't need you to come. He said, what do you mean? He said, well, I am a man under authority. The very first statement he said is, I'm a man under authority. And because I do what the people above me say, then watch this. The people under me have to do what I say. Because I'm under authority, I'm in authority. And the only reason why I'm in authority is because I'm under authority. So he says, I'm under authority, then I have people under my authority. And the people under my authority are subject to my words. And so when, if I say, I can tell people under my authority, go, they have to go. I can tell them, do, they have to do. And so there's some stuff, there's some people that are not under my authority. So those people are not subject to my words. But whoever is under my authority is subject to my words. I perceive, Mr. Jesus, that sickness is under your authority. And because it's under your authority, it's subject to your words. Therefore, I don't need you to go. I just need you to say. Speak the word only and my servant will be healed. My point is you got to be under authority to be in authority. Say amen to that. Colossians chapter 3. The Bible says, wives, submit yourselves to your own husbands. Right? So don't, don't walk up to my wife talking about submit to, hey, no, the devil is a lie. Like, she, submit to me. She submits to my, her own husband. Say own husband. Even as unto the Lord. All right. First Timothy chapter three, verses four and five. He must manage, this is about, talking about men, must manage his own family well and see that his children obey him. And he must do so in a manner that is worthy of full respect. If anyone doesn't know how to manage his own family, how can he take care of God's church? Ephesians chapter 6 and 1. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. There's some young people in here. Let me read that again so y'all heard it. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Colossians 3 and 20. Children, obey your parents in everything, for this pleases the Lord. And Proverbs 23 and 22. The Bible says, listen to your father who gave you life and do not despise your mother when she is old. Yeah, you like that, right? Listen to your father. That joker gave you life. I gave you life, boy. I brought you in this world. Hey, watch it now. And so, so my point is, with all those scriptures, here's the point. You're in a position of authority. You're responsible. When Eve ate, nothing happened. Think about it. When Eve ate, nothing happened. She was not the one in charge. When he ate, the eyes of both of them were open. You're the one that's in charge. 
God is holding you accountable and responsible, but God will never expect you to do something he has not equipped you to do. And so whatever he equips you to do, he expects you to do. Say this. Say, I am a leader. Say, the grace of God is on me to lead. So what you don't want to do is take on the pressure to perform. You don't want to think that you have to perform. This is not about performance-based religion. What you want to do is when you embrace the grace of God, the grace life, you can actually be working while you're resting and resting while you're working. You could be working harder than you've ever had in your life, but you're not stressed out. You're not taking on the pressure to perform because you know that God is the one who's giving you the words and performing the work. Uh, 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 so, for example, I remember I'll just use this an army example. I remember I used to be the CTO of the army, the chief technology officer for the United States Army. So I was the army's face to industry from a technology perspective uh, at the at a global scale, responsible for 1.4 million uh, users around the globe, global operations, yada yada yada. I would have to go represent the army to industry and communicate to industry what the army requirements were in order to shape industry IRAD, in, internal research and development dollars and communicate all of this. Conversely, I would have to go to the, sec, the army top four, secretary of the army, undersecretary of the army, chief staff of the army, vice chief of staff of the army, and communicate to them what technology was and where, the, where industry is headed. I can't tell you how many times I'm walking down the hall of the E-ring of the Pentagon going down to the corridor where the Secretary of the Army's office is or the Chief Staff of the Army's office is, walking down that hall, reminding God that I was minding my own business when you gave me this job. You know what I'm saying? I mean, I didn't even ask for this. You know, just, you know what I'm saying? I didn't ask for this. I was minding my own business. You put me here. This ain't about me. This is all about you. Everybody here, God knows that I'm a man of God. If I look stupid, you look stupid. Don't let me look stupid. You know what I'm saying? And so I don't take on no pressure to perform. And so I would go in there and before I walk in that room, I'm like, glory, you got to give me something. You know what I'm saying? And then I'll go in that room and then be talking and I'm like, I'm quiet. I'm like, Holy Ghost, you got to kick in. And then, they, then they'd be like, what do you think, chief? And I start talking and, and people in the room be like, wow, what's, you got a card? What's his name? Who is that? I'm say, I said stuff I never heard before. I got to write it down. You know what I'm saying? I was like, man, that was good. That was good. My God, that was good. You know what I'm saying? Why? Because it's not about you. You, don't, you can't take on the pressure to perform. And the same thing that I did when I was in the Pentagon, I do it as a, as a husband. I do it as a father. I do it as the leader of my household. I don't Listen, how many of you know that you can have four, five, six, somebody says seven, 15 kids. Lord have mercy. But anyway, you can have five kids growing up in your house and all five be different. Like, like, who is this? Like, I mean, like, how can these kids be so different? But say, I have the grace for it. You have the grace to parent your children. You have the grace to be a husband. You have the grace to be a father. You have the grace. You, you can't take on the pressure to perform. The grace of God is on you to do it. Say amen to that. So listen, the two major things I'm telling you today is number one, God has called you to be a leader. Number two, you don't have to do it without God. The grace of God is on you to do it. So let me address these three areas so I can let you go. Number one, the grace of God is on you to lead your family in the area of faith. Say faith. Okay. As a man, you have a responsibility to be the spiritual leader of your household. Oh. Brother Pena, can I talk to you for a minute? Yes. Man, my wife has been saved like 47 years, and I just got saved. And, I mean, I know I'm supposed to, but how am I? Listen, first of all, your wife has been praying for you all that time, right? Second of all, she is so happy that you're born again. She just wants you now to hear from God. And whatever you say, she's going to submit to it. Why? Because she's been praying for you all these years. Matter of fact, God used her to lead you to him, if that's your situation. So listen, just embrace the grace for it. Don't take on the pressure to perform. Brother Pena, how am I supposed to lead my, my children? My boys are in ministry. My boys are part of this ministry or that ministry. It's like my kids know more Bible than me. Okay, well, number one, open up your word, <laughs> right, and get in the word. And number two, stop beating yourself up. Just embrace the grace to be you. You are supposed to be the prophet, priest, and king of your household. You need to pray with your children. My children know they don't go to school 
and now I only have one left in the house, but none of them would walk out that door without me praying for them every day. And so my little one that's 10 years old, my office is in the basement. Sometimes I'm in the basement and I'm doing something and it's time for my son to go. And so he'll make an announcement on the Alexa, be like, Alexa, announcement. Dad, I got to go. Hurry up. Come upstairs, you know. Or he'll run downstairs to my office and be like, hey, I got to go. Come on, come on, come on. And he knows he can't walk out the door without me praying. Why? You need to pray over your children. Your children need to know that you are a husband, that you are a father, and that you decree, that you declare, that you believe in the power of prayer, that you're not going to let your children go out there. Your children need to hear you praying. Your children need to have, your your children need to pray with you. Your, Your children need to see that you bring the family together. Sometimes you should take communion at home. And and, and my, my, man, my father, my dad is leading us in communion. My dad is a man of God. My dad is teaching us how to pray. I can hear my dad praying. And listen, your children need to know that you are leading them, guiding them, directing. You don't have to have all the answers, but whatever you do, you're already in the position of authority. They're already submitted unto you. They want to hear from God through you. Say amen to that. But I don't want you to take on the pressure to do it. Listen, today, the Lord told me this morning that that when we pray at the end, there's going to be a heaviness that falls off of people. Like Milton was saying, like, like, oh, it's hard. No, no, no. If you thought it was hard, good. I'm glad you did. But today, that's going to fall off of you. Say amen to that. We're going to learn how to enter into God's rest. We're going to learn how to believe God. And watch this. Your children need to know that you believe God. All things, Mark 9 and 23 says, all things are possible to him that believes. All things. Say all things. All things are possible to him that believes. Your children need to know that you're believing God for something. You're believing God for this or that. As a family, uh, we've been through so many experiences with houses and and like ministry. And my children have been there. My children have been like, hey, the Lord said we're moving, y'all. I don't know where we're going, but the Lord said we're moving. I got to go out here and find this house. And and when we find it, it's going to be the one that the Lord gives us. And my children have heard me announce that out loud. In the kingdom of God, nothing happens until you announce it. What you don't want to do is wait till it's over and then tell your kids, well, I was praying. No, they want they need to hear you say it first. They need to hear. They need to see faith. They need to see that. You know what? We're standing. You know what we're going to do, guys? We're believing God to be able to give this amount this year. Let's believe God that, that we want to sow into revive, that we want to give you. They want to know that you have goals, that you're hearing from God, that you have a vision, that you can cast that vision, that, that they are part of something that's exciting. Hey, guys, you know what we're going to do next year for spring break? We going here like, like this past year uh, for spring break. I took my, my oldest. That was when the oldest one that was at home, child number three, I, I said, hey, Senior year of high school, where do you want to go for spring break? I'm going to let you pick. That joker picked Thailand. I was like, spring break, dude. Come on, man. So it went, well, we went to Thailand. Eight days, seven nights in Thailand. Uh, but, 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 but they need to know, like, yeah, we're going to do stuff as a family. We're going to believe God as a family. We're going to pray as a family. We're going to spend time together as a family. Come on, say amen to that. You have the grace to do it, and there's this grace that's waiting on you to lay hold of it. Wouldn't it be a shame for you to get to heaven and for you to realize that there was all of this grace stored up for you to do all the things that God called you to do, and you never tapped into it? It it reminds me of a story of this older couple that went on, uh, that saved up all their money to go on a cruise. And, And because they had spent all their money on the tickets for the cruise, they brought a bunch of lunch meat with them. They brought tuna fish and lunch meat and Vienna sausages and stuff like that. And so uh, they they ate. They were on the cruise for eight days. And for seven days, they ate lunch meat and canned food. And on the last day, they said, "Okay, well, we got a little bit of money left. Let's go to a restaurant so we can celebrate. And when they went to the restaurant and they pulled out their money, they was like, what are you talking about? No, everything on the cruise ship has already been paid for. And it was like, what? It was like, yeah, you could have been eating like this every day. There's a level of grace that's on your life that you're not tapping into. Listen, you have the grace to be a father. Say it. Say, I have the grace for it. I have the grace to parent my children. I have the grace to be a husband. I have the grace to be the spiritual leader of my household. Your wife is a help meet, and she will help you meet whatever vision God gives you. But let me say this. Warning, warning, warning. If you don't come up with a vision, she will come up with one for you. 
Women ain't going to just sit around and be like, forget this dude. Then I mean, like, yeah, if you don't give him something to work with, then don't get upset when she's talking about, I'm going back to school. I'm starting this business. I'm going to the gym. I'm going, and, well, hold on, babe. No, you got to give her something to work with. If you cast a vision, she will help you support it. But if you don't cast any vision, she's going to run without you. Because what a woman is not going to do is stand by idly and sit by and watch you waste everybody's life away. Say amen to that. Say, I have the grace for it. I have the grace to lead my, high, my, my household. I have the grace to be the spiritual father of my children. But I have to believe. I have to lead my family in faith. Third John chapter 2 says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you will prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Say this. Say, my soul prospers. You will never experience life prosperity beyond your level of soul prosperity. So with God, it happens on the inside first. Your soul is your mind, your emotions, and your will. Your thinker, your feeler, and your chooser. The way I think, the way that I feel, the way that I make my, my decisions, that's my soul. And your soul has to prosper. Say this. Say, I believe what God believes about me. You got to get to the point where you believe what God believes about you. When your soul is lined up with God, then now you're believing on another level. And now you're, you're leading your family to do things that you guys have never done before because you're believing God. Let me say it another way. Uh, I have a saying that I say, your legs will never take you where your soul has never been. Your legs will never take you where your soul has never been. You have to be it on the inside first. You have to be it in order to see it. If you can't see it, you can't have it. When, when God took uh, uh, Abram and said, hey, Abram, guess what? Uh, you're going to be the father of many nations. But he didn't have no kids yet. He said, you're going to be the father of many nations. But he had no kids yet. He says, hey, Abram, all the families of the earth will be blessed through you. But he didn't have no kids yet. So at night, he took him outside. He said, hey, Abram, look up. He said, okay, what do you see? I see stars. As many stars as you see, that's how many kids you're going to have. Then during the day, he said, go outside. He said, what? Look down. What do you see? I see sand. As many as grains of sand are on the seashore, that's how many kids you're going to have. God was trying to get him to see it on the inside because if you can't see it, you can't have it. If you can't see it, you can't be it. Later, when he was trying to give him the land, he, he takes him outside. And he says, hey, I'm about to give you some land. We got to pray for Israel too. Israel was just attacked. And so, so listen, I want you, I'm, there's some land I'm giving you. And the Bible says, see, I'm giving you the land. See, I'm giving you the land. All the land that you can see is what you can have. You are only limited by your capacity to believe God. If all things are possible to him that believes, then if you don't believe, it's not possible for you. It's not that it's not possible. It's just not possible for you because you don't believe. Listen, how many of you know that healing is available today? A lot of people don't believe that. So if you don't believe in healing, healing is not possible for you. It doesn't mean healing is not possible. It's just not possible for you because you don't believe. Your children need to see a man that believes God. Say, I believe God. I believe God. All right, so that's, that's in faith. So your children need to get from you faith. Now, your children need to see a man that is committed to his family. Yeah, say, say, I am committed to my family. What you don't want to do is be a hero outside and a zero at home and so so my friend Craig just retired 34 years of service and Craig one of the things that I mentioned in his retirement ceremony is that it's a blessing that his wife was there and his three children were there and and so what you want what, what I what I said I learned a long time ago actually Pastor Carlos when we were in first Cav, uh, uh and I went to Bosnia um, the assistant division commander that went to Bosnia his name was General Dubik one star and General Dubik stood up in an OPD in the chapel uh, in Bosnia, I was actually the pastor of the gospel service, so he was in my church doing an OPD. And so he was there giving us a professional development session, and he said that what you don't want to do is get to the end of your career and stand there at your retirement ceremony and not have a family. So he said, what would it matter if you gain the, all the rank in the world and you're standing there all alone at your retirement ceremony? Say, I have the grace to lead my family. 
You have the grace to lead your children. You have the grace to lead your spouse. You have the grace to deal with your children in accordance with the way that God has designed them. They're all different. I have a son that's a chef. I have a, a, a daughter that's running a, a social media management company. I have a son that's in college right now that wants to do a film. And the youngest one said he wants to, to be a surgeon. I'm like, how can these people be raised in the same house? You know what I'm saying? I mean, but you have the grace for it. You have the grace to be that parent. You have the grace to be that listening ear. You have the grace to be a man, to be an example. They are looking to you and they need you to be that father and your wife needs you to be that husband. Say amen to that. But you got you got to embrace the grace for it. What you don't want to do is take on the pressure to perform and say, oh man, now I have to do this. I have to do that. Watch this. Let me say it this way. I said it this morning on a, on a little one minute clip video I posted. You can, there are people that have ruined their lives doing what God told them to do. Let me say that again. You can do what God told you to do and do it the wrong way. You can be doing what God told you to do, but try to do it in your power, your ability, and your strength. Why do pastors commit suicide? Real talk. Why are pastors committing suicide? Because they're trying to do it as a human. You cannot do what God called you to do without God. Why are there pastors that quit ministry? Leave the church. I'm talking about people that are called. Why? Because they're doing it as humans. They're doing it with the sweat of their brow. They're trying. You cannot do what God has called you to do without God. Listen, being a parent is not easy. But. If you embrace the grace of God, you can do it. I can't tell you how many times as a parent, we've been to schools or you've been on the road or now like you're almost like an Uber driver with all these games and stuff. And you're driving people here and there or you're in the hospital and you're praying over your children or you and your wife are going through something and you guys are on your knees. Listen, you have the grace to do everything that I just said, but you cannot do it without God. Say amen to that. You were never designed to do it without God. Let me say this and then I'll move on to my last point. If you look at the book of Genesis, in Genesis, in the creation account, God created everything in five days. And on the sixth day, he created man. And when he created man, he put man in charge of everything that he created. Right. So if you look at the creation account there, everything, say everything reproduces after its own kind. So if you look at the creation account, God spoke to the earth and he told the earth to bring forth every herb yielding seed. So because the, the herb yielding seed, all the plants were supposed to come out of the earth, God spoke to the earth and it came out of the earth. Right. When God was creating all of the animals in the ocean, uh, uh, <laughs> we talked about last night, like like marine life, God spoke to the water. And God spoke to the water, and out of the water came all of the animals that are in the water. Same thing with the air. God spoke to the air, and the birds came out of the air. So when God wanted to create plants, he spoke to the ground. When God wanted to create marine life, he spoke to the water. When God wanted to create birds, he spoke to the air. When God wanted to create us, he spoke to himself. Here's my point. If you disconnect a plant from the ground, it starts to die. Because whatever he spoke to is the source. If you take a fish out of water, it starts to die. Because whatever he spoke to is the source. When God created you, man, he spoke to himself because he's the source. You were never designed to be disconnected from God. You were never designed. If you were disconnected from God, you start to die. Last point, say this. I have the grace to lead my family in the area of finances. All right, so there's four areas, uh, four types of giving that I, that I teach on. Uh, uh, I have a book. I have multiple books. Uh, but but uh, there's four areas that I teach on. The first one is tithes. Say tithes. Second one is offering. Say offering. The third one is sowing into ministry. Say sowing into ministry. And the fourth one is giving to the poor. Say giving to the poor. My children know that we participate in all four categories every month. And we have for over 20 years. So my kids know that we give. My kids know that we're a family that gives, that, that in our household, 
God has blessed us and, and everything that comes in, we give way beyond the tithe. It's not just tithes. We, f- we fulfill all four of these categories every month. And we teach them how to do that. And, we, and our children know that we do that. And we're not, that we're, we don't keep them from that because we want our children to know uh, because the Lord convicted me. When my oldest left the house, he said, Dad, you let me leave the house and I didn't know nothing about money. And I was like, okay, fine. You know, well, you, we got three more kids, so <laughs> obviously, you know, I can, I can make some changes. You know what I'm saying? So we got to teach these kids something about money. And so, so, and it's not just about budgeting. It's about how to honor the Lord in the area of your finances. Your kids need to know that as a family, we're going to honor God. That as a family, we sow. And watch this. Whatever we sow, that shall we also reap. And because we sow in the area of finances, and we have financial goals. And as a family, we're believing God to give this amount. As a family, we're believing God to give that amount. Let's sow into this and let's sow into that. And our family knows. Like I was just at a birthday party in Georgia. Uh, 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 one of my, my previous pastors was turning 65. I'm at this birthday party and I'm there with my kids and, 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 and I'm seeing all these people's like a family reunion and all of that. And, and I'm standing there with my son and this kid that, well, young man comes up to me. He's maybe he's like 18, 19. He says, uh, uh, sir, you don't remember me? I said, no. He said, he welled up. He said, when I was a little boy, my mama came to you and said, I didn't have a coat to go to school and I needed a backpack. And you took me to Burlington Coat Factory and you told me to pick whatever I wanted. He said, you don't remember that? I said, no, because I've done that for a lot of people. I said, no. But he said, you would never know the impact that had on my life. My son was standing right there. My 17 year old son was standing right there. And of course, he knows we've he's been with us. We've taken people to buy groceries and all kind of stuff. Obviously, I take my kids with us as we give out, as we hand out food and they're there as we're handing out backpacks. I take my kids on missions. They need to know that we're not just here living for us. They need to know that our life and the money that comes into our household is not just about you. It's not just about buying another car or buying another purse or buying some more sneakers. Oh, come on, man. You got to make an impact in this world. And as a man of God, your children need to know that you guys honor the Lord in the area of your finances. Say amen to that. Your children need to see that. Watch this. Because some things are taught. Most of it is just caught. Your, your children are paying attention to your lifestyle. And, and there's more things that they learn from you that you didn't say. So they need to see that we as a family honor the Lord in the area of our finances. That we as a family, everything that comes in, we honor the Lord. That, that, that nothing comes into our household that we're not going to honor the Lord in the area of our finances. That we're, not, that we're not one of those people that tithe sometimes. You know what I'm saying? No, we honor the Lord with everything. And, and because we do that and we're committed to giving, then watch this. You can't beat God's giving. The more you give, the more he gives to you. So they need to know that you're blessed and why you're blessed. They need to know why you're able to do what you're able to do because you're honoring the Lord in the area of your finances. As I close, let me just say this about poverty because God had to deliver me from a poverty mentality. I was raised on welfare. I hated buying food with food stamps. I hated it. Government cheese. Didn't like it. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, you know that cheese, right? Um, but for real, for real, it bothered me that we had to take assistance. And God had to deliver me from that. My wife grew up poor for real. Because when you're in another country, you don't have welfare. So if you don't even have welfare, you don't even have that. So my wife grew up with no running water, no electricity. Real, real, real poor, for real. Like, like they had meat sometimes once a week. She, sometimes breakfast for her was hot water with sugar. And dinner was butter with uh, rice. And so God had to deliver us from a poverty mentality. So as I wrap this up, let me just say something to you about that. The answer to poverty is not money. Let me say this again. The answer to poverty is not money. If you look at John chapter 7, and you look at what happened when John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin, got locked up. So Jesus' cousin got locked up and he was in jail because he had said some things about some authorities and maybe he was supposed to say it, maybe not, I don't know. But the bottom line is he, he wound up in jail and he was about to be beheaded. And he wanted 
Jesus to get him out of jail. He wanted his cousin to get him out of jail. And so he says to his disciples, hey, man, go tell my cousin, are you really the one or should we go look for another? Come on, dude. What you talking about? You know you, uh, he's the one. I mean, like you leaped in your mother's belly. You know what I'm saying? I mean, like you said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. You know, but now you're offended. And people say things even in church when they get offended. Anyway, so he says, you go ask my cousin. But this is what Jesus' response was, Eli. Elon. He said, you go tell my cousin this. The blind see. The lame walk. Lepers are cleansed. The dead rise and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. Let me repeat that. He said, tell them the blind see, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the dead rise, and the poor have the gospel preached unto them. In other words, he was saying, I am the answer and I'm here to provide the answer. If you're blind, the answer is seeing. If you're lame, the answer is walking. If you're a leper, the answer is new skin. If you're dead, the answer is life. And if you're poor, the answer is not money. Jesus never gave anybody $5. Jesus never said, here's $5. Or like Dominicans would say, I give you five dollars, no problem. <laughs> you know? Well, I have no thing. I got five dollars. You go five dollars. No, he never said, he never gave nobody no money. He said to the poor, I'm going to get the word down inside of them. Because if I get the word down inside of you and you're poor, one day, if you meditate and meditate on the word so long, one day you're going to get up and walk out of poverty. One, you, one day you're going to say, I, I can't live this way no more. Because the word of God will change the way you think. The, listen, as a man of God, you got to pour the word of God down in your children. you gotta, you got to lead your children in the area of faith and family and finances your children need to know that as a family you're going to believe God as a family you guys believe what God believes about you that you're going to stand on the word of God that you're going to pour the word of God into your children that you guys are going to decree and declare you're going to believe and receive you're going to make the impact that God has called you to make but then again it won't be you doing it it's the grace of God on you so you don't have to take on any weight you don't have to take on any pressure. You don't have to take on any stress. You can do everything God has called you to do, but then again, you will not be the one doing it. It is the grace of God on you, the grace of God in you, the grace of God through you. Say amen to that. Let's stand all over the room. Come on. Listen. I know what the Lord said to me this morning. <sighs> so let's be quick about it. If the Holy Spirit was pricking your heart while I was preaching, and that's you, that, don't worry about the person to your left, don't worry about the person to your right. Listen, if I preached on healing, I would call for everybody that needs healing to come, right? I preached about grace and how you don't need to stress. If you've been taking on stress to be a man, stress to be a husband, stress to be a father, stress, I'll go, Lord, I don't know what I'm doing. If that's been you and you feel that that weight and you know that this is you and the weight needs to fall off of you, run up here to the altar. Come on, quickly, 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 quickly. We're going to pray over you. The power of God is going to be released off of you. I'm talking about the weight will fall. There's a weight that will fall today. I know the Lord told me that when you come to the altar, that when you leave, you are going to leave free. That this weight that's on you is going to fall off of you. So I'm just going to give you a moment to pray. I'm going to give you a moment to, to cast your cares and cast that stress and cast that anxiety and cast that pressure over to God. Just release it. And then I'm going to pray over you in a minute. But I want you to release it now. Let that thing go. You were not designed to walk around with stress. You were not designed to walk around with worry, anxiety. That You were not designed. You were designed to enter into God's rest.